All right. So I have got right at one o'clock my time. So we are going to go ahead and get started. As I said before, if you could just take a minute and in the chat box, just put your name and your county. And then if you have anybody else with you, that way I have a record of who's, who's all on. I'm trying to keep track, but once I start going, it'll be more difficult for me to remember um, to write people down. So, all right, I'm going to share my screen. So today we are starting our third session of the, sorry, I'm getting the, there we go. Okay, there we are. Sorry, I'm trying to get the chat box up and who's on so I can see. But today we're doing our third session of our 4-H orientation. And this the session that I'm talking about today is a little bit out of order from where I normally teach this session. It's usually later on, but as I looked at the timing, um, as far as the time of year, it seemed like this was a good place to put this as we're starting our new 4-H year and um, looking at things that we are, you know, things that we need to do to kind of start off. So we're going to talk today about, and some of you may have seen part of this, part of this presentation. Um, when I very first started, I did a similar presentation on the enrollment and reporting, but, you know, th new things always come up. But, you know, as we're starting to do our enrollments, um, I just want to remind everybody about the different delivery modes as well as the different, um, and then also kind of some of the definitions of, of where things fit. And then also, as we're, as we're planning our programs throughout the year, the other piece that I really would love to see have done is uh, measuring our our programs, doing a, an evaluation. And I will let you know that what I'm gonna talk about today is not a full-blown, what you would see extension educators doing as far as evaluation, but this is just to help you to understand how to do some of the, this just real simple evaluations to know if what you're doing, maybe it's an after-school program or maybe it's a, you know, just a variety of, of settings, but just give you some ideas. So we're going to start with enrollment and reporting. So we're going to, we, there are, well, here we, within 4-H, we have one way of reporting, and that is through our 4-H online. And what, um, and then there are, but there are other ways of, of, um, reporting for other ed for other individuals within the organization. Eventually, I would really like to be able to not only get our our numbers, but I also would love to have a system where I can find out some of the impacts that are happening, some of those um, qual those qualitative or those stories that are being shared. And so, because those are the things that I'm I'm asked for a lot. You know, what are some things that make a difference? You know, can you explain to me? Um, you know. Numbers are great, and we all know that our that our county commissioners and our state legislators and everybody like numbers, but we also like to tell that story. And so um, I know Claudine has been trying to figure out a way that we can do some kind, you know, do that that reporting. And I know some of you may give that information to your extension educators, but I, I'm really trying to figure out a way we can do that within our 4-H program. But we come up with our ES 237, which is just extension service 230, um, form number 237. Uh, and that we, gather, we get that data, data from 4-H Online, which I know all of you are intimately um, familiar with at this point. But just to kind of our reporting system with 4-H Online, it, this reports our enrollment numbers for youth and adults in clubs. Um, in groups, it gives us our project enrollment numbers, it gives us achievement and event participation. There's also a way, and we don't have that module right now turned on to our 4-H online. Um, I know Erica is trying to figure out how to do that, but uh, there's a way to track train, like if you do leader trainings, there's a way to do that, and then again, we get that ES-237. 
So what is that ES-237? So this is really a census count of our 4-H youth um, and adults that participate in an extension-sponsored uh, significant program, educational experience. So the one thing that we need to remember, and this is something to share with all of the, um, all, anybody in your offices, and I know I've tried to share it in other places too, but um, it's any youth that is reached by um, extension needs to be reported in the in through 4-H online so we can so we can get that information on the ES-237. When it goes to USDA it's not only looked at by by National 4-H headquarters but it's also looked at by the other program areas um, to see where our youth numbers are are being reached. So again, you know, that's, and also you, um, it is a way that we can track our adults who work with youth programs or who, who hopefully in the next year will be able to get the data or be able to get the module for the, um, for the adults that work with, with, or the adults who attend training. So who should report on the youth participation? Again, it's, I know it's called 4-H online and, and we get a lot of that. Well, it's a 4-H report. Well, no, again, it is anybody that, um, that um, works with youth within extension. So things like junior master gardener, if we have um, our SNAP ed or um, FNAP uh, doing school programs, those would be reported there, range camp, bootstraps, the project magic, all of those need to be reported within this system. So there are a couple of ways that you can do reporting. So one of those is individual enrollment, which all of you know about. That's where we have, um, we have our, uh, you know, we have a detailed, individual demographic demographic data for for our youth and our adults so that includes their name and their address this is what we do require for all of our 4-h members and our and our adult volunteers then there's also the group enrollments so this is where uh, you might go and do a program in a school where you might do six weeks for an hour long, um, you know, it's just a school, it's a school enrichment program where you're doing STEM or you're doing healthy living or something around that area. Um, this is where you may, you're not going to be able to get individual data, individual um, detailed data on all of those kids because number one, our schools don't, don't release that data. Um, but so you can do a group enrollment form. And I am, I do have um, the group enrollment form that I can, that, or actually I can show that to you guys now. If you have not seen that group enrollment form, I just have to find where I put it. And I will, here we go. Um, I will also be share, when I send this out, to everybody when I send all, you know, how I send the recording and, and then all of the handouts, I will send this group enrollment. And I have tailored it, I put the Nevada logo on it. Um, for those of you that have it, maybe with the, with the University of Idaho logo still on it. But basically what you're doing is just taking the name of your group um, and then you're just coming up with some demographic data. And you're just, and you do that by your own, um, you know, hopefully you can, you remember that day to take the data down. Um, I don't always, I didn't, I was not good at that. I will be perfectly honest with you. But so when it came to say our, um, the, the racial, or the racial information, sometimes if I didn't take that data down, what I would do would be to go and I would go back to the to our, my the census data for the for the county, and I would use so in the in the county I worked at in Michigan, we had a 22 percent Native American population. Now, to be perfectly honest with you, there was a lot of times when I was in uh, when I was in the county and doing a program, I could not by looking at the group, I could not tell you. Um, who was Native American and who was not, being in the Midwest, um, you know, they we had a lot of redheaded, green-eyed Native Americans. And so what I would do a lot of times is just take the, 
whatever my total number was by the 22%. I know that's not the best way to do it, but sometimes that's just kind of how it, you know, if you forget to write it down, um, then you can, then you can do it that way. Or just try to remember in your, in your mind what that is. And so, like I said, I will be sharing this, um, sharing that with you. So that way you've got that, that group enrollment form. And the best way I found as a, you know, as a county professional is honestly, if I could remember to do those maybe once a week, I'd set aside an hour and try to do my group enrollment forms and then get those to either I entered them into the system or get them to the person that needed to enter them into the system. Just helps. Um, it helps everybody. <laughs> that way you're not trying to remember what what the you know what those numbers were later on and you've got um, you know and you can just you know it's done and you don't have to enter it all at the bottom sorry I'm okay there we go all right so then what I want to talk about now is our delivery modes and this is probably where we sometimes have the most confusion within the program and so I really want to spend some time uh, going over the definitions and these are the federal definitions um, of what each one of these what is supposed to fit within each one of these. So this is our list. I mean, we do have a very long list of delivery modes. I know um, 4-H, we always say in 4-H, you know, we are available to, to everybody in a variety of ways. Now, your county may choose not to offer all of these delivery modes, or you may choose to offer, you know, all of them. It's, it's up to you and your county, but I think it is important to know what all, they, what all are available. The first four are probably the most important for us because those are our club enrollments. And so, um, let's see, okay. So an organized 4-H club. And that is, so it says E there, and no, I wasn't being crazy. If you look at the ES-237, um, Box E is the total number of organized 4-H clubs, and then box A is your community club, B is your in-school club, C is after-school clubs, and D is military clubs. And so that's why it looks goofy there. But basically an organized 4-H club is that organized group of youth that's led by an adult with a planned program with a planned program that's carried out through all or most of the year. Or, you know, they could do a six-week program you know, maybe they do a six week project, but, and that's fine, but it is a planned event. So the types of 4-H clubs that are available. Number one is a community club. So this is the most traditional of our delivery modes. This is the club that's chartered through the county extension office. The clubs um, should, include, should include at least five members from three different families, um, but the, we do have, and then follow that national definition. And if you don't know what the national definition is, let me know um, and I can get that to you. Or actually, I'm gonna make a note to maybe send that with this um, because there is a definition of what constitutes a 4-H club. Okay, sorry. So, um, but basically it is, um, you have five members from three families. They have some type of, youth-led leadership experience. Um, I, I can't, they do, I can't remember exactly, but anyway, um, this is also where your project and your family clubs, so you may have um, a club, so there's a community club, so they offer, maybe it's, um, they have an organizational leader and they offer a variety of projects. Maybe they offer beef and sheep and leather craft and vet science and cooking, and they have a different adult volunteer for each one of those projects, but they all come together in, you know, for monthly meetings, um, and then the projects do their own meetings on top of that. That is, um, when you look at our 4-H history, that is our definitely our most traditional method. 
Then we also have, and this is becoming more and more popular, where it's project only. So you might have a club that only offers one project. They have one or two volunteers. Shooting sports is one example. We have a lot of counties that just have shoot, a shooting sports club. Now, they may offer the different disciplines within shooting sports, or they maybe offer one. But that would be a project-based club. You still report those in that community club sp um, space. There is also um, our family clubs. And so, and I don't know how prevalent these are in Nevada. I'm guessing that they probably are fairly prevalent in the fact that we, that there are a lot of families that live in the middle of nowhere and are unable to get in to, to town for regular meetings. And so if you do have that, then those, and they are chartered, um, which we're going to talk about chartering at another time, but that is one, um, that this is where they would go. Then there are in-school clubs. Now, this is where I want to make, these are, the next two are probably where I need to make the clearest um, explanation of what those are. So an in-school club, this typically does not um, apply to Nevada unless you have a group within a school that during the school day, they actually hold meetings, they elect officers, they, um, that, and they, they do, um, they have an actual club, they hold business meetings. If you are going into a school and just doing a program within that school, then that, it falls under a different category. But the in-school clubs, the reason I say that does, does not typically apply to Nevada is because that is traditionally a southern region delivery mode. So if you live in Georgia, your kids are going to be exposed. Almost every uh, fourth grader, I think it is in Georgia, is exposed to 4-H. Um, the county extension 4-H professional in Georgia, they are all educators, but they go into the classroom. Um, they have business meetings. They elect officers. They do everything a traditional club does, but it's during the school day. And they also do a project. So um, that is, so I just want to make sure everybody understands that, um, you know, it, like I said, if you do have, and, and every once in a while we do have some of those, then that is great. We can, um, then you would report those. But if it's just you going into the school and, or a volunteer going into the school um, or even a teacher using our curriculum, then that is a, that is what we call school enrichment. Um, the after school clubs, again, that is um, if they are a chartered club and they have business meetings and they elect officers and they're doing those um, key elements, then they would be an after school club. If you are working with a partner um, organization or if you yourself are just doing an after school program either at your school or at your office or something, then that would be, again, another delivery mode that I'm going to talk about in just a second. And then we have our military clubs. And so military clubs are those clubs that are typically held, typically um, housed at a base. Um, so at, um, in Clark County, they would have military clubs. In Washoe, um, a lot of times they do have military clubs as well. And then also the same with Churchill County. There are, because there are uh, military bases on those, on those facilities. Or if you are working with National Guard, and um, which the, there used to be a program called Operation Military Kids. Some of you are familiar with that program. Uh, we would have 4-H clubs within National Guard units. Um, that program does, does not exist anymore, and so we don't have as many of those um, in existence. But I know we still have some military clubs in, in Nevada. So then we have our special interest in short-term projects. So these are that variety of youth development activities and those events that, are, that involve direct teaching either by extension professionals or are trained and certified volunteers. These could be like, um, and we're going to go over some examples too, but just to kind of give you an, an idea. So I know, well, one of them could be the National Youth Science Day. So many of our counties did National Youth Science Day experiments. 
and while it wasn't a six hours of instruction, there was still edu excuse me, education involved. Um, probably, I'm guessing it was at least two hours. And these, and so that's where you would um, put your special interests or short term. Also, multi-day meetings or conferences, um, things like the Discover Your Future conference that we that we uh, will have again, hopefully in the near future, or Capital Days, or some of those um, those types of events. Or if you do something. Um, probably not necessarily in your county, but um, as far as those multi-day uh, where they, you know, come, but that is where you would, would put those. The other example would be like a fall festival. If you, if you and your volunteers actually did education with kids, you know, maybe, or I'm thinking, so the example that I'm thinking of um, in Clark County, they went to a, uh, there was a, a youth science day where they brought in 2,500 kids from around the county and they did. And so 4-H was there, extension had a presence there and they were doing science experiments with the kids. So about, they had about 15 to 20 minutes with each kid, but they were there all day. Now granted that is, uh, but there was education and they did the experiment and talked about science. And, and so that's where you would, um, Put those numbers. If you were just at the fall festival handing out brochures and talking about what 4-H is all about, then you would not count those numbers. But if you're actually doing education, then you do count those. And then we have our camping delivery modes. So there are two delivery modes within camping that we need to, to be aware of. And so this is when an um, youth take part in an extension planned educational experience with a group living in the out of doors. Now that may not be typically what a day camp, but it would be um, for our overnight camping. And this one I really, really want to stress to everybody too. So overnight camping is where you uh, take your kids and you go to that overnight experience. So it could be a residential camp, a primitive camp, or travel camping. So the example 4-H camp at, at Lake Tahoe, that would be included in overnight camping. Now, one of the things that we are running into in, in Nevada is we have got um, a lot of kids signed up for a overnight camp project. Those, that is a delivery mode again, um, and so they need to be, they need to be put as a group enrollment in this section. Now you can add them through 4-H online to use an overnight camping activity, so that way you can keep track of which 4-Hers um, go to camp, and then you have non-4-Hers that go to camp. And so, but you can add that as activity, but then when you enter that into the database, or enter it as a group enrollment, then it would be, those would be duplicate members. So, um, we really need to make sure that that is, um, that that is important because of the because of that and and we had a lot of that this year um, and so I'm just trying to get that fixed and then also our day camps so I know several of you do day, day camps I know Clark County does quite a few day camps I think Washoe County does some day camps those are typically a theme based um, kids come and learn for the day and then they go home at night. They may be um, coming, you know, it may be a multi-day program, but they go home in the evenings and that's where you would, it, that's where you would put this enrollment. So it would again be a group enrollment. So um, one example that I always had was in Idaho, we had a lot of counties that did spring break camps. So they would, during the week of spring break, they would offer a different topic. They might, they may have offered two different topics a day, maybe one in the morning, one in the afternoon, and kids could sign up for one or all of them or three of them or four of them. Um, okay, Molly, I will get to your question in just a second. Let me finish this thought and then, um, but, so for the um, so for day camp, so what they would do is actually depending on the number of uh, the number of sessions. So 
Like in the case of when the county did one topic in the morning, one topic in the afternoon, um, they would do a group enrollment two times on that because they had two different topics. Maybe it was cake decorating in the morning and leather craft in the afternoon. So they would do two topic, two group enrollments. But if they had 10 of the 15 kids that participated in both of them, so in that group enrollment, then there would be 10 duplicates and then five new. So it really, it only counts as five. But I just, you know, but we are reaching them in a different, um, it's the same delivery mode, but a different topic. So on Molly, for overnight camping, no, they do, they, it, that is a group enrollment. Um, day camps is a group enrollment. Pretty much um, the special, anything but the club enrollment is a group enrollment. So that's why I'm saying for, for overnight camp, we don't, um, they need to be entered as a group enrollment. The other piece that I want to, um, and then you can put them in as an activity under the 4-H'ers name so you know that they did attend camp that year, but they would be included in that group enrollment just as a duplicate. And, and um, if, you have, if you have questions about how to do that, Erica can walk you through that. I can actually walk you through that. Group enrollments, I do know. <laughs> That's the one thing I do know how to do. So uh, just so everybody is aware of that. Um, the other. So I just want to make sure people understand the day camps and the and the um, and the overnight camps because this one seems to be one we have a lot of issues with. The other piece on overnight camps, I know that we have a lot of counties that go together and do camp. We have a western camp, we have a, a central camp, and we have a southern camp. So I want to make sure that everybody is clear because I, this I I think we had an issue with it this year is so. Lyon County, you report your Lyon County kids. Um, Churchill County reports the Churchill County kids that went to camp. Um, Washoe, you report your Washoe County kids that went to camp. It might take the person that's organizing that camp to actually send those numbers to the counties. I don't know um, how that's organized, um, but that needs to happen. I think this year we had, for one of the camps, we had one county that reported all of the kids for the, they had like 250 kids reported for overnight camping. Well, I know that not all 250 kids were from that county only. Um, it was actually, you know, that was probably the whole total group. So we need to make sure that that, that we follow that too. And then school enrichment, this is again where you are going into the school and or you might have a volunteer going into the school or you may have um, teaching teachers using the curriculum. Um, I know that we have um, in several of our counties, we have been putting there, there have been programs put together to train teachers on our STEM curriculum, or maybe it's on our healthy living curriculum. And so you need to try to get those group enrollment numbers from them. When you give them the curriculum to use, give them the group enrollment form at the same time. But this is where you're going in during school hours and you are um, there to support their school curriculum. So you are, are providing that kind of extra um, programming. I know um, examples of what I used to do in the count when I was in the county, I would go in and teach character counts. Um, I taught character counts within the schools to the kids. I also taught character counts to the teachers so then they could teach it to the kids. But because and while character counts isn't a 4-H curriculum, if some of you are familiar with character counts, um, it's a national company that puts out a character education curriculum. But um, it was, you know, because I taught the teachers how to use it, I would usually collect the data for about a year um, from them, you know, because they used because they used that and because we were involved. It's also, um, and again, that can take place at a public or a private school, or if you have a homeschool association that wants to use our curriculum, which seems to be more and more popular is our homeschool so our homeschool or homeschool families like the 4-H curriculum because number one it is if they aren't um, 
they use it as a supplement sometimes to the online stuff or if they're not using the online they like it because it's research based they're going to get activities they're going to have everything spelled out for them so um you know you want to make sure you get that and then also um this is where the fnap or the snap snap ed programs that when they go into the schools or they do youth programs this is where they could be reported especially, like I said, if it's an in-school program. And then we have individual study, um, the mentoring, the family learning programs. So if we had, and we just had this come up by one county, um, where we have a family that just one individual member, you know, one child wants to do the pro, wants to do a 4-H project, mom is going to be the mentor basically for the program. And so, um, that is, you know, this is where you'd report that, um, where they're working on a project or an activity, um, they're working independently and not as a club. And then we have our school age child care um, or after school. So this is where the uh, educational programs are offered um, to youth outside of school hours. So it usually takes place at a school or a community center. Um, it incorporates 4-H curriculum it's to provide provide care for for youth while ch while their parents are working or they're unavailable so again it's typically experiential learning um, with a sequential hands-on activities and they can be on early release days maybe you know they've asked 4-h to come in and do you know a couple hours where when they have early release days or if you if your school is going to a four-day school week which we have quite a few now i'm i'm understanding in nevada that have gone to four-day school weeks um, i know in idaho we had a lot of count or a lot of school districts do that and 4-h came in and provided a provided a um, lesson for um or provided educational activities for that fifth day so parents had a place to take their kids um it can also it can um you know they can do a variety of things this can be where extension provides this program by themselves or in partnership i know i just um as jasmine's on and i haven't replied to your email yet but i did get it um working with the boys and girls club you know there may be a time that we work uh, partner partner with the boys and girls club and we go in and do programming um i was at a at a meeting a few months ago and we had the denver county 4-h educator come into the into the meeting and talk about the programming that they're doing and one of the things that they have done is 4-H didn't have the bodies to do programming, but they had the materials to do programming. The YMCA had the bodies, but they didn't have the materials. So they partnered together. 4-H came in and trained the YMCA, YMCA staff to use our curriculum, and then that their staff provided the education to the youth. Um, it's a win-win for everybody and you know same thing like I said same thing with boys and girls clubs or any of those programs that you have in your community and then instructional TV and video programs um, I will tell you that I have not necessarily seen any numbers in fact um, when I was just at our national 4-h the 4-h agents meeting in New Orleans last week we all of the state program leaders got together and we had a conversation about the ES-237 because we're looking at um, trying to make some changes to it. And one of the things that um, that was brought up was when was the last time in that this ever had any numbers reported to it? And the last time anybody can remember was the 1970s. Um, I don't think anybody on here was around in the 70s, um, but for those of you in Washoe, so Marissa and Samantha and Sam, ask Sarah about Mulligan Stew, or I think it was the 80s. Um, Mulligan Stew was a, was a program that was offered via video. I think it actually was maybe on TV. I can't remember exactly. It was before my time. Um, but it was, but this is one that we've been looking at for things like podcasts, um, web-based learning, and then also online learning. That could be one of the options that we move to in the future. So um, I want to share some examples with you guys. And 
I'm gonna have I'm pulling up my document. Um, let's see, it was delivery methods. And this was one that that I shared with everybody at one point. Um, and I'm gonna I'm gonna send this out. This is one that was actually created in Idaho, and but it's still very relevant. Um, I I need to change it so it fits Nevada, just so everybody doesn't you know. But I think it has still has some really good um, information in it, and so I just like to share it. It gives those examples. So here we have um, club chartering, so or uh, organized club. I, hopefully, I've ex explained that to you. Um, the after school clubs, and so you can see. Sorry, I'm starting to lose my voice. Um, you can see the example that they give is the YMCA has an after school program that meets five days a week uh, per week, five days per week. They ask 4-H to start a club. Um, every that meets every Tuesday and then um, and uses co community members so you may have volunteers that come in and serve as as leaders for that club but it's actually taking place during the YMCA um, after school program so that's an example of how that after school program can be a club and then again we have the military clubs um, and then uh, the special interests are short, short term. So, you know, here we've got a, a 4-H Friday activity that's held twice a month um, where they can, you know, where kids come in and learn about local, um, a variety of 4-H curriculum or ambassador training. I know we have our committee right now that's trying to finalize the ambassador um, program um, to get it up and going again. So hopefully in the near future, we'll have that up and going. So when those kids go to, when those, when those young people go to ambassador training, they would be, that would be a special interest or short term for your county. Or if you do the same thing for your own county ambassadors, if you do a, maybe you do a two day or a three day retreat for them, um, you, that's where you could include that. And one of the things that happened in Idaho was an extension farm and forest fair. So I'm sure all of your communities do very similar things. And this would be, it's a day long fair where elementary students come in and they learn about best farm practices and food production and forest management. They go from station to station to station and they learn about these things. So again, that's another um, example of, you know, that's short term. Or the gardening classes are offered to, um, every Saturday for six weeks. You know, it's not dependent. Kids don't have to go to any of them um, or, or don't have to go to, all of them, they can go to one or they're different topics every week. Kind of like, um, I think of it as the Home Depot kind of model. Um, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the Home Depot, um, the classes that they offer on Saturday mornings for young people, like it might be learning how to build a birdhouse one day, or the next day, you know, the next Saturday, it might be making something, you know, some kind of, I've seen duct tape wallets, or, you know, they just kind of do a variety to showcase their products. And so this could be the same type of thing where you're showcasing our products, which is our projects or what we have to offer. Um, and then overnight camping, hopefully I've explained that. Um, day camping, so an example, one example, I shared some, but like one county used to do a lamb camp. Um, or they did district-wide lamb camp where kids came together. It was actually, I think, three days um, where they came and learned all about lambs and how to raise lambs and how to show lambs and everything. And But they went home at night. Um, or wildlife camp is another one. So those are some examples. School enrichment, again, the extension or the nutrition education programs um, are probably going to be recorded here, but not necessarily. Um, School age child care, that's what we consider after school care. Um, again, that's kind of one of those changes we're trying to get made in the ES 237 because that's their definition and in order for everything to match with the federal report, we have to still call it school age child care. That is a very 90s term, um, but you know, hopefully eventually we'll get it. But that's where, you know, it might be, um, we might partner with a, with a, 
school funded after school program or we might partner with a couple of different programs. An example that, that I had the personal experience doing, um, when I was in Michigan again, I hired an AmeriCorps VISTA worker. We had a grant um, through the state, and so I was fortunate enough to get an AmeriCorps VISTA worker. And they partnered with one of our schools to offer an after-school program. It was just, I think, one day a week. It might have been two days a week, I can't remember for two hours a day. So kids would get out at three and the program was over by five, five thirty. And it was, um, it was an after school program. And what they did is she taught cultural awareness. And so it was a cultural after school program. So the first week they might learn about Mexico and the next week they learned about, um, you know, or not, um, hungry and then one week they'd learn about you know your or uh, england and so she picked a different country and and so and then we would provide a snack for the kids um typically we tried to make it some sort of cultural snack but we didn't always get to do that and just a little hint this is you know on because you um, a lot of new people but check if you have a local food bank check with them to see if you can get a discount on, on items there. We would go into the food bank and they had a lot of snack items. And this was a small community of like, the whole county had 16,000 people. So the, the town that we lived in was like 5,000 people maybe. So it was small. I mean, not small compared to like Ely or some of those, but it was, you know, a small community. But we could go in and buy like graham crackers and we could buy fruit snacks and we basically non-perishable um, Rice Krispie treats. Now, granted, they weren't always the healthiest, but they were, we tried to keep them as healthy as we could. But I think it cost us like 30 cents a pound to get the, these snacks. And then we could take them into our after school programs and feed our kids, feed the kids for next to nothing. And we really didn't have to have grants in order to do that or it would stretch a grant further to be able to have those funds to be able to feed feed those young people. So that's just check with your food bank if you have one and see if they have that kind of um, arrangement. Some food banks don't have like food that they have on hand, they just, you know, it's whatever. But um, anyway, so that's one. And then we have, um, so those are the, those are basically the examples. And then we do have that group volunteer training. Um, like I said, I am really trying, it's not a category typically used, but I'm trying to get that module uh, turned on. I think it's just going to take me paying a little bit more money to 4-H online to get that module turned on. So that way uh, you as a county staff can keep track of when volunteers, uh, when they go through training, when they do their orientation, when they, you know, if some counties, I don't, I have not heard of it in Nevada, but um, a lot of a lot of places around the country are going to where 4-H volunteers need to do um, at least five additional hours of training per year. Um, whether that be county-based, it can also be with other organizations if they could, if it's something youth development related, um, then they will accept that. So again, um, I just want to share, and I'll share this document with you, um, so that way you've got it. And then the last one, oops, okay, cancel. Sorry, I'm trying to pull up these documents. Um, the last one that I'm going to share with you that I will be sending to you as well is this document. This is the federal government. Now, granted, this these are the ES-237 um, definitions. And I, to me, it's, it really is helpful. Now, granted, I know that it's a little bit older because um, Alan Smith has been retired from USDA for, I think I was in Michigan, so probably about 15 years ago or more <laughs> that he retired, but, uh, they, that, but they haven't changed the ES-237 at all. Um, it hasn't been changed since I started, so 20 plus years ago. 
but it gives you the, those definitions. And again, I'm going to be sharing this with you, but this is um, the ethnic classification, Hispanic or, Lat or Latino and, and non-Hispanic and non-Latino. So those are, you know, you can see what that, is, what that classification is. And then, so they have to do their ethnic classification as well as their racial um, classification. Sorry, I need that chat box up. Every time I switch, it takes it away. Um, so you have those racial, um, those racial classifications. Now, um, the one thing, so you may have a Latino that they also have to classify, are they white, are they um, black, are they uh, uh, American Indian, Asian? So typically, um, the white classification is you're going to have a lot of Latinos that will also classify as as their their racial classification is white because they come from Europe or Spain um, or North Africa or the Middle East and then so it gives those definitions and feel free if anytime you want to share these with your volunteers or your families you can do that um, you also have your racially ethnic um, groups. On your group enrollment, um, you're going to be asked for, is this a mixed community? Is this an integrated group? So if it is a mixed community, if within your community you have a racial, a racial mixture, um, then you would mark that and of potential participants. And then your integrated group is if you have more than one racial ethnic group that um, is represented. Okay, again, it gives those definitions. Um, talks about youth enrollment, youth membership, youth participants. So essentially a youth participant is any youth that is that is participated in some kind of extension, um, extension program. A, a 4-H member are those that we collect individual enrollment data for. Um, let's see, adult participant, um, this might be, and typically we don't have adult participants, we have mostly just 4-H volunteers, um, but again, it just gives those definitions. Sometimes it'll ask you for direct and indirect volunteers. Um, direct volunteers are unpaid support to the 4-H program. Those are the ones that get face-to-face -face contact. Your indirect volunteers may not have face-to-face -face contact with youth. So those would be, um, if you have somebody that sits on one of your committees that is not necessarily a club volunteer, which happens. I mean, we get that, um, we get that once in a while. Somebody just says, you know what, I want to volunteer for 4-H but I don't want to lead a club. I don't have time for that kind of commitment. And so you find something for them to do, um, then that would be an indirect volunteer. And then a middle manager, a youth volunteer, an adult volunteer. Um, so lots of definitions on this page. And then it also goes into the delivery mode definitions. Okay, are there, I know that that was really pretty quick, but are there any other questions that you didn't type in regarding the, um, the definitions? Everybody's pretty quiet. Is everybody still there? <laughs> All right, good. Well, and as, as you get questions, um, please feel free to, you know, and especially when you're starting to do those enrollments, please don't hesitate to either send myself or Erica through the Zendesk. Um, you know, if it's just, hey, where should I report this? Send that message directly to me, but if it's, you know, something goofy, but, you know, um, please, ask those questions. Um, I'd rather, you know, have people ask them now than when we get down to, you know, to finalizing. Okay. Um, not quite yet, Molly. I will let you know, hopefully by the end of this week, um, on the pending members. Um, I'm, I'm trying to get it done. I've got about five other things, but I, I am, Erica and I met last week when we were in New Orleans. Um, National Youth Science Day is a group enrollment. Yes, 
that's how I would do it. Um, if you had 4-H members that also participated in that, then you could put that as an activity within their, uh, within their record. So that way you know that they participated. But to me, I would put them under a group enrollment. And so that's the same goes for Samantha. I know that you did yours at your typically your regular after school program. Um, but because it was kind of a, a special event, um, you could it would be up to you up to Washoe, but I would, you know, if it was me, I would I would put it in as and then put it under um, I'd have to look to see which which um, I you know which program to put it under, but I would probably um, put it in since it was a kind of extra special activity. All right, any other questions? Okay, so we're gonna go back. So I'm gonna switch gears. If you come up with another question, please feel free to, you know, you can still type it in and I will get back to it. Um, if I don't answer it now, I will go back to my chat and answer it. But so we're going to go switch gears a little bit and go on to evaluating for impact. So the reason I want to talk to everybody about this is I think it's really important that we find out if the programs that we're doing are, are meeting the needs of young people. And there's a way to do that and there's a way not to do that. Or our volunteers. If you do a volunteer training, um, it's great to do an evaluation at the end. And you're gonna hear my soapbox a little bit on, um, on this topic. So you'll have to, everybody will have to bear with me um, when I get on my soapbox a little bit, but you will. Um, because there are things that you ask and things that you don't ask. So let's just talk quickly. So this is based on the work of Donald Kirkpatrick, um, who was at University of Wisconsin at Madison, and then Myron Amy, who was at North Dakota State University. And basically, I'll just let you know, I took this PowerPoint from Dr. Amy, and he's fine with it. He was my advisor during with my, um, with my PhD, so he's good. He knows I took it um, because to me, it was the simplest. It just explained evaluation in such a simple, simple term, terms. And it, actually, I was able to understand evaluation a lot better because of it. So basically, at the end, you're going to be able to state, so in evaluation, you always, and program planning, we always want to know what it is do you want to know. And you need to plan the evaluation from the very start, not have it as an afterthought. And so that's why I'm giving you the objectives. Um, you know, at the end of the presentation, you're gonna be able to state why evaluation of a program is critical to you and your county program. Um, know what the Kirkpatrick's four levels of evaluation are, and then use some of the guidelines for developing tools. So why do we evaluate? We need to determine the effectiveness of the program design, um, you know, how was the program received by the by the participants? You know, did the how did learners fare on the um, how did they fare in the assessment of the learning? Did they think they learned anything? And then also to determine if our instructional methods or the way we taught worked. You know, both the presentation mode, the the method, the learning activities, and the desired level of learning. You know, there's been a lot of times that I've gone out to teach both adults and youth and it completely bombed. Now in those cases, I pretty much know that it completely bombed and I'm probably not gonna have to do an evaluation to know that, but sometimes it's good to know what it was that caused it to bomb. And so, you know, it might be a way to, um, to find out. So um, why should we evaluate program improvement? Um, should that program continue? You know, there's some things within our county programs that we do just because they've done it for 150 years or 100 and what is it now 115 years and you know there's no reason so we need to look at it why are we still doing this is there educational benefit to that um 
we need it a lot of times to justify our existence. Again, you know, our county commissioners, state legislators, and I'm probably, um, hopefully, they'll ask me to pull together some things for 4-H for the upcoming legislative session that we can share with legislators. Um, so I may be asking some of you at the county level, can you give me some anecdotal um, stories that, that I can turn around and share? You know, I can pull up all the data I want, but I need those personal stories. And then also um, to, re to determine our return on investment, um, both the human capital, um, the individual competency, and the social and economic value. So there's four levels of evaluation. So during, um, you do, during the program, then you're going to do like, immediately following a program. You're gonna be doing a level one, which is our reaction. Um, you know, how did you like this program? On a scale of one to five, how did you feel about this program? On a scale of one to five, how, you know, was this program beneficial? Did, what was the thing that I learned? You know, what's the one thing I remember? Um, and then also you're gonna be doing a level two. What, were, what did they learn? Um, you know, what's one or two things that they remember from the, from the presentation. Post-program evaluation or post-program, that's when you conduct a level three and a level four. Now, I will tell you right now, straight up, you guys, I don't do them, and probably it's not going to happen um, at the county level where you're going to be doing a post-program evaluation where you're going to be trying to get that level three and that level four. I'm going to explain those to you so you know, um, but chances are you, you may not um, do those. But what you're looking for is behavior change. So six months or three months down the road or six months down the road, you're going to go back and ask the, the participants, you know, what's one thing that you, that you have implemented from participating in this program and what, um, and how has that changed? you know, change your life or whatever. And then number four is the results. You know, how did that, you know, did you, you know, has your, um, so we do that a lot in crops. If, if you implemented the, the procedure that we taught you, did your yield go up thus, you know, causing you to earn more money. So I'm going to spend the bulk of my time talking about level one and level two, because that's the ones that we do most often. So level one is a reaction. This is more of a customer service measure. Um, you know, were they pleased with the program, their perception if they learned anything. At this point, you know, if you're doing it immediately following the program, they, yes, they're gonna, they have a perception of what they learned. You know, you're not gonna really find out if they learned anything until three or six months down the road when you ask them what they remember. And if, if they remember something, then they did learn it. The likelihood that they're going to apply the content um, and then also the effectiveness of your particular strategies you know um, if you've got something that you're trying that's new and you want to find out how it worked then you can ask that question and then effective of pack effectiveness of packaging the, the program or the course that's a little um, that I need to fix that terminology but so the one thing this is my soapbox <laughs> <laughs> when you are planning a, uh, if you're going to do something like this, and you're going to, and you're doing like so, um, this happens a lot on like statewide events. Um, this happened every year on the state leaders forum in Idaho. Drove me crazy. How was the hotel? How was the food? How was you know the room conditions? Okay, we don't need to ask those questions. That you were there. You know what the food tasted like you knew what the reaction of the food was from all the people around you. You know what the hotel was like. You may not have been in the rooms, but I can tell you um, when I went to extension annual conferences, I, they were almost always in Boise and I would stay at my parents' house rather than spending the money for a hotel room. And, but you know what, by gosh, I didn't stay in the hotel rooms, but I can tell you what they were like because I heard about it the next day, you know, when the hotel ran out of water at 6 a.m. Um, you know, so there's those types of things. Um, you know what the room conditions are like. You know if it's too hot or too cold. I can tell you, you know, I can almost guarantee you I don't need to put on the evaluation from last week's conference that the rooms felt like a refrigerator. 
and that I came home with a slight cold because um, I would go from a 40 degree room where I had to bundle up to an 85 degree humid outside, you know, um, anytime we had a break. And so, you know, they know that because they were there. The, the conference organizers were there. So please, please, please do not ask about the food. Don't ask about the rate, you know, the, and they're not things you can do anything about at this point. All right, that's, I'm in, I'm done with my soapbox. <laughs> so now we're gonna give you some examples of some questions. And this is where I think, this is what I think is the most important. So one example of a level one question could be, in your opinion, please, or in a word, how would you describe this workshop? So the intent of asking a question like that is to get that feedback um, about the about the program. You can also you can also assess whether your response. This sounds funny, but you can assess whether your whether whether the people answering the questions have transposed the numerical scales. So if you ask on a scale of one to five, how did you like this program? Five being the least or I mean, sorry, one being the least, five being the highest. I cannot tell you how many times I have people transpose those. Um, because technically when you do programs like, when you do a, a scale like that, you should start with the positive, so the most, you know, the, the strongly like or strongly agree first and go down to the strongly disagree. So you should go five to one instead of one to five. That's just an evaluation thing. You don't have to, but they say that that's the way you should do it. Anyway, but it'll tell you whether they transpose those. And I get that all the time, and then you have to figure it out. Because you can, you're gonna ask them a question here in one word, describe this workshop, and they're gonna say, great. And then the next one might be this Likert scale, and it's gonna be you know one to five, one being the lowest, five being the highest of how well did you like this program? And they answer a one, then you know that they transpose those numbers. Okay, again, you know, on a number, using a number, how would you describe this program? So terrible, average, outstanding. So this gives you your quantitative or your um, numbers data. You can get, you know, you can come out with an average score for that. And again, you know, kind of watching that. Uh, and this is where, you know, 3.25% of, the or you know on average the participants ranked this workshop a 3.25 out of five um and then how much did you know about this subject before taking this workshop or taking this program um how much do you know about this subject after participating in this workshop that could be you you would ask both questions and then that's not their actual learning but their perceived learning um, how likely are you um, to use some or all of these skills taught in this workshop in your work, your community, or your family? And again, it's their perceived relevance of the materials. So that may also go back and relate or correlate back to the satisfaction that they felt. So they feel like they're going to use it a lot then they'll probably feel really good about it. If they feel like they're not gonna use it at all, they probably didn't have a very good score on how much they liked the program. So other examples, if you wanted open-ended questions, the best part of this program was the one thing that could be improved most. Um, again, the, again, this gives you that anecdotal or what's called qualitative feedback um, about the program and it helps prioritize the work um, if you're doing a revision um, of the of the core of the program then this will help you to prioritize that if you get the one thing that can be improved most then that would be a uh, that's uh, you know those are things that you can revise if they are you know you're gonna get somebody that said the food was horrible well okay throw that out you can't do anything about it um, but you can also develop your themes so just quickly, some guidelines on evaluating reactions. So you decide what you want to find out. You design a form that will quantify those, those reactions. So you figure out what questions you want to ask. That's why I've given you some examples. You know, you guys don't need that. You guys, I'm hopefully helping you so you don't have to come up with those questions. I've given you some examples. You can tweak them, but 
It's a way to do it. Encourage written comments. Again, that's how you get the best response, I think. Um, when you give it to them as soon as it's over and before they walk out of the room, then you're going to get um, that immediate response. If you wait a couple of days, and um, sometimes it's better to do that, but a lot of times it's not, um, you can get that, uh, that immediate response. So things like camp probably be good. Now, like this conference last week that I was at, they, it's a couple of days, you know, I think I, in fact, I think I just got the evaluation as we've been talking today. Um, and in that, what that does is, so if something happened like, um, well, we felt like we didn't have hardly any green vegetables. For those of you that are FCS and, and health and nutrition people, you know, that's a big deal. And, but what it does is it gives you that kind of delayed reaction. I'm not as upset about it now that I'm home for two or three days as I was there. I mean, not that I was really that upset about it, but, um, but that's something, you know, that's one reaction. Um, get, you get honest responses. You, it did, helps you to determine acceptable standards and it, um, or you determine what the acceptable standards are. You know, I've gotten re, I've gotten results back. I had one, I did a workshop for teachers one time. Oh gosh, this was early, early on in my career. I was teaching them character education and it was a, it, it was a bad situation to begin with. Um, I had over 120 teachers in a room, just me teaching. Don't ever do that. Um, they, it was after school and it was an early release day. Teachers were required to be at this training. Again, don't ever do that. Um, because they thought, you know, the school thought, oh, this will give us a chance. And so, and then I had feedback on the evaluation about how I needed to go back to Michigan State and take Speech 101. And they were, I don't think, and so I threw those out as acceptable standards because they weren't acceptable standards. But to me, the teachers were just upset because they were forced to be there. And it was, it was um, never again will I do that many people by myself. Um, from then on, it's one trainer for every 50 people. So just, you know, think about those types of things um, as you're going along. You know, those are acceptable standards. And then measure future reactions against the standards, too. I, um, in, my, in the colors, the colors personality, I do, typically when I do that presentation, I get evaluations back from everybody, and I'm able to, to gauge the different audiences and can see what audiences it goes better, goes over better with than others. And so I think that that's where you're looking at those reactions against what the standard is. All right, any questions on level one, kind of that reaction? I'm gonna, I'm going to venture to say 95% um, of the evaluations or 95% of the assessments or, you know, looking at what you're, what you're doing, you're going to be doing a level one um, questionnaire. Okay, no questions. All right, so level two is learning. So we're going to find out about their learning. So the extent to which participants change their attitudes, um, increase their knowledge or increase their skills. What exactly did they learn and didn't learn? This might be a pre-post test. Um, you know, I know in, in shooting sports, we used to do a pre-post test. We do a pre-test before they got to the shooting sports training. And we would do a post-test when they, after they returned from the training to see um, if there was any, if they learned anything or, or figured out, you know, what they didn't know or so there's a variety of ways that you can do that. So it requires um, specific learning objectives. So when you do this learning, learning um, when you're doing a level two, you need to know what your learning objectives are. One of the sessions I'm gonna be teaching in this orientation, it's later on, it's one of the last ones I'm teaching, but how do you write a lesson plan? So many, um, so many of our, you know, staff don't come necessarily from an education background where, the, and I don't know how much they're teaching how to write lesson plans anymore, um, but how to write, and I'm not going to go into a lot of details about lesson plans, but I think it's important to know. Now, I don't necessarily write down a lesson plan every time I go to do any teaching anymore, 
but I, in my brain, I have worked through that lesson plan because I've done them enough now, but I think it's important to think about what is that learning objective and they need to be objective and quantifiable. So you need to be able to measure them. So, um, and ways that you can do that are paper pencil tests. You can look at the performance on skills, um, uh, skills tests, simulations, role plays, case studies, et cetera. So some examples, you develop a written, a written exam based on the desired learning objectives. So um, one of my last things that I did in Idaho, I think it was the fall semester before I moved here, was I taught this orientation, these orientation sessions, but they needed somebody to teach the introduction to uh, 4-H youth, or 4-H youth development programs, or so, I can't remember what the course was, it was in the Ag Ed department. And nobody in the Ag Ed department at the University of Idaho had ever taught, or they were not 4-H volunteers, they were all, they had all been Ag teachers their whole life. And so they really didn't know what to teach. They had been getting uh, 4-H volunteers to teach this course, which was fine, but there's a different perspective um, from a 4-H volunteer to a, to a staff person. And so, so they asked me to teach it. Well, to try to fit another course in was nearly impossible, or to fit something else in. So what I did during the orientation sessions, the students participated in these sessions. And they, what they would do is they would, um, they would take a pretest. So the students had to take a pretest before the, before they participated in the webinar or watched the webinar, and then they would participate. And then at the end, they would have to take a post test. And so what that did is told me, you know, what learning they they gained. So again, you know, use the exam as a pretest. Um, allow the participants provide them with a worksheet or activity sheet that allows them to track things during the session. Um, make sure that you're emphasizing key and repeat those key points during the session. Uh, they say a person needs to hear, see, and do something at least seven times before they remember it and so, or make it a habit. And so, you know, sometimes you have to say, do, and, and um, hear something seven times. And then you can use that same pretest as a post test exam, and then you can compute that pre post uh, or yeah that pre post gain. Um, just some things about what makes a good test. Only valid qu test questions emerge from the objectives. If you have if you're asking something that's not on your learning objectives, chances are you're not going to cover it in the workshop, so they're not going to be able to answer that. Um, again, consider writing a main objective and then maybe some supporting objectives after that. Test your questions. Um, usually test the, the supporting objectives. If you don't have time to do that, you know, it's okay. And, you know, realistically, they say for a test to be valid, um, you should ask more than one question on each object objective. Well, we don't want a 2,500 page paper you know, test. So um, if you can do that, if you can get a couple, then that would be great. If not, it's not that big of a deal. But consider using scenarios. So another strategy, sorry, I turned my paper, but didn't turn this. Um, another strategy to, to gather learning, level two learning, is consider using scenarios, case studies, um, sample project evaluations, um, rather than test questions. So developing a rubric, of your desired responses. So you could develop uh, three, three to 10 questions or scenarios for each main objective. So, you know, a rubric is always a good thing. What is it that you, you know, that they should be learning? Uh, pr provide instructor feedback during the, during the learning activities. So this might, this is going to require you as the instructor to monitor the participant discussion, to, to look at, to watch them practice their activities and engage with them. And then you're going to provide them feedback. So when I'm doing the colors, uh, personality inventory, everybody breaks up into color groups, so into their main personality group. What I do is I purposefully walk around the room and listen to their discussions. And if I feel like they're not, they're not quite getting what they need to get from that, if they're not answering the questions, maybe they're answering them like another group or something, I will provide them feedback of, okay, think about this, what, you know, and, and give them some little key tips. 
So just, um, so, you, you know, that's one way. And, you know, even anything I, you know, I tend to walk around and then ask questions. Um, some people think I'm being social, but there actually is a point to it. Um, you might also ask participants open-ended questions during the activities to find out their understanding. Drives my son crazy when I do that at home. So example of a level two, uh, which of the following should be considered when evaluating a reaction level, the reaction level. So can we, ask, can we get access to the national evaluation site? Um, I will answer that in just a second, Karen. Um, so this is, so the examples of level two is, um, so I want you guys, this is kind of my, this is my, um, Share. I should have put this in a poll, but if you guys can tell me, um, just give me the numbers, like the top one is number one, so obtain is two, get. So what are things that you need to consider when evaluating a reaction level? Which is a level one. You can just type it in the chat box. Nobody's answering. Okay, get 100%, yes. Yep. So essentially, um, you know, you're, you're only gonna wanna evaluate the lesson content. It's kind of hard, especially with the reactionary, um, you know, that it's hard to ask them other things if you haven't taught it to them. Um, you should obtain both, yep. Um, subjective and objective responses. Yeah, we've got the number one, number three, and number four. Get the 100% response. Honest responses are important. You're not going to, um, you shouldn't share this only with the course instructor. Um, I think it's important to share this with anybody that's involved. And then, so another one, match the following um, to the choices below. So what, what is a reaction level? Um, you know, which letters would be, would you get for a reaction level? Which ones do you think, what answers would you get? B and D, good. Okay, and so for the learning level, um, it might be A and C. So you're getting those changes in performance at work. Possibly. That's a little bit harder um, for a level two, but it, it could be for a learning because they're learning something and then they're going to implement it in, in at work. But you are going to get organizational improvement because you're going to be able to tell you know, what exactly their learning is. And if they're not learning what you think they should be learning, then you need to go back to the drawing boards and figure out how to teach it. If only I could teach Cody's math teacher how to do that. Um, okay, so you could also use a scenario. So an instructor would like to know the effectiveness of the course design and how, or the program design and how much the, the participants have learned within that program. They would like to achieve at least a level two evaluation. So that's the scenario. And then you're going to ask them, what techniques could the instructor use to achieve a level two evaluation? So you would go back. So then the, the participants would go back. And you could do this as a group activity, you know, two or three talking. Or they could do it individually and then do a pair share where you pair with your partner and share your answers. Um, and then also, what should the instructor also consider, or should the instructor also consider doing a level one evaluation? Why or why not? So again, you're giving them a scenario, and then they're giving you um, the the responses, and that's going to show you whether they learned something or not. And you would either you could either have them write it down, or you could have them, or you and collect it, or you can have them share as a as a big group. So you could also use a rubric for a scenario question. So again, your in, um, directions are use the following topic checklist to determine the completeness of the participant responses. 
So the learner demonstrated an accurate understanding of what a level two is, okay? They understand that it's a learning level. Learner provided at least two specific examples. Um, learner provided at least two specific examples of that they understand how to get participant responses. Pre-test, post-test, performance rubric, scenarios, case studies. So you can see that's, you know, this would be a rubric. Any questions on a level two? And I know Karen asked a question about getting access to the um, national evaluation site. So what Karen is talking about there is um, on a federal level, they have created what we call the, the 4-H common measures. Now those are um, specific to different, um, like they have one for 4-H science, they have healthy living, they have, um, they have uh, citizenship, they have some universal life skills, like decision-making responsibility, some of those things. They have come out with social and emotional, um, social and emotional uh, indicators, and then they've come out with um, workforce or career, at, career readiness, like, like college and career readiness is what I think they call it. Um, and right now each state is given one access, like, I'm the only one in the state that has that username and password. The reason they do that is for um, the integrity of the data because, so if I sent it out to everybody within the state right now, if you, you would only have access to Nevada data, but Karen, you would have access to what Jasmine's doing in White Pine County and not saying anybody would go in and do anything, but in order for us to uh, realistically, like if we have to get a, a IRB, a, a institutional review board approval on a grant, or I mean for a project, for a research project, we can't, we cannot say that that data is protected um, because so many people have access to it. So we actually do have an evaluation uh, and I sent, and I can send the questions out to anybody and I can create the, the survey. We're hoping at some point we can get um, a student, but that can that I can create the survey for you if there's questions specific questions that you want to ask. I mean, there's no reason not to. You're going to be hearing more and more about that um, in the near future. We have we have created a evaluation and assessment working group within the state of Nevada, and they are working on an uh, evaluation plan for those types of of things. But um, like I said, I can if you have specific questions. The biggest thing that I found with that instrument is um, it's, a, it's a fabulous instrument, but a lot of times I would have counties send me, okay, I want to answer, or I want these, que these 10 questions from the, from the database, you know, and, and I'd put those, and then they, and the question I always asked was, what is your learning objectives? And realistically, they weren't teaching those. And so you have to really think about, you know, making sure that your, what you're teaching matches up with those indicators. If that, but it does give you the questions. Um, I don't have those right now, but I can, you know, if anybody wants a list of the questions, a hard copy list of the questions, we can do that. We just have to, like I said, data integrity is the biggest, is the biggest issue right now. Um, and so we're still trying to figure that assessment, that evaluation assessment working group is trying to, trying to figure that all out. So, but like I said, I can, I've got hard copies of everything. Okay, any questions about a level two? All right, we have just a couple more minutes and I'm gonna zip through these level threes, this level three and level four. So essentially a level three is a behavior. You're gonna to wanna to find out if there was a behavior change. How did the training affect their performance? To the extent which, behave, did, which change in behavior occurred? And was the learning transferred from the classroom to the real world? And then the key is we wanted to transfer. I mean, we want, even if we're teaching young people, part of that transfer is they've gone home and taught their parents what they learned at this workshop. Um, you know, that's how 4-H got started. We taught our young people how to grow corn in a more effective uh, fashion. And they went home and taught their, you know, they, they went home and did that. 
um, and they got a higher yield than their parents were getting. And so they then, you know, so then the parents started adopting those practices. Same with, with food preservation. You know, that was really the first thing that we taught uh, girls in 4-H was, was safe food preservation practices. And they went home and taught their mothers. And so the, uh, the, the cases of botulism and, and salmonella and all of those things that come with food preservation diminished greatly. Um, and so a person must have the desire to, in order to, to have this, you know, and sometimes the people that show up, even for kids and for adults that show up to our trainings, they do it because they have to, but they have to have that desire to change, know what to do and how to do it. They need to the work in the right climate and then be rewarded for those change. So again, you know, some of the climates, and this sounds really, uh, this is more geared towards adults, but I think it's very, um, it, it does fit with youth too. Preventing, they're forbidden from using, um, from the use of the learning. And I think that that can happen in the home, you know, where we teach a young person one way of doing something, but maybe that's not an acceptable practice at their own home. Uh, off the top of my head, I can't think of one right now, but you know, maybe we teach a young person how to use a sharp knife, you know, like a six year old, how to use a sharp knife or eight year old um, for cutting up apples, but they aren't allowed to use that at home. So it's a forbidden practice. So they can't use it. It's discouraging um, or it's neutral. Maybe they've just ignored that learning or it's enc um, encouraging. They're, they're receptive to applying those new learning and then it's required. Um, probably not with our, with our kids, but might be. So some guidelines for evaluating behavior, you measure it on a before and after basis. You have to allow time for that change to happen. And then it might be a survey or an interview um, you know, that to by one person who might be in the best position to see that change might be the participant or the learner, the supervisor or the mentor, the subordinates or peers and or others that are familiar with the participants um, actions. So guideline guidelines for evaluating behavior again, you know, getting 100% of response or sample, you know, you have to think about that. Depends on the size of the group. If you're, you know, um, one of the things we're going to be doing in the next year is we're actually going to be doing an evaluation of the 4-H program using the common measures tool and we're going to be probably doing a sample of the state we're going to we want to evaluate um, the kid all of the kids within the program but we need to do it um, but you know you're talking 3500 young people that are enrolled in the club program and so we really need to do a sample rather than a full-blown um, survey and again you know you can just see some of those there may not um, so some examples um, maybe you do observation maybe you just look and see if that behavior has changed survey or an interview you have performance benchmarks um, before and after control group don't worry about or there's evidence or a portfolio one of the reasons why we do a portfolio for 4-H is looking at what is their learning um, you know by having to do it later uh, that gives them the opportunity to say yes this is how I've applied it in the real world and if your portfolio doesn't include something like that of this is what I learned during my project now it's been three months since I completed this project what else you know how have I taken what I learned here and and applied it to my own life uh, sorry I'm going the wrong way and then again, here's an example of a patterned interview. So you might ask, you know, specific questions, um, portfolio. And so you could, um, so if I was doing one on this evaluation, what I might do is in six months, I might come to you and say, can you send me an example of a level three evaluation that you designed? By doing that, I see what you've done. I'm a copy of a level two evaluation that uses one or more methods of evaluating learning. Um, and then the level one. And so this gives you, you know, that's one example of something that you could do. And then the level four. And this is one, like I said, I'm not going to spend very, very little time because I've only got a few minutes left. So um, the impact of education and training on the organization or the community, again, you know, you guys could, you'll be able to read this, but 
you're looking for that change in the community. So how did the training save costs? You're going to see this more with our educators, um, you know, doing some of the, like the, the goat, uh, meat goat production workshop that just got sent out the other day that that's going to be happening. You know, in six months, are they going to see a difference? Did it, did it save costs um, by the producers implementing some of those methods? And then again, you know, you can see some of those guidelines. Um, okay, so the other thing I want to do is I want to share just a couple. I'm going to share just an example of, if I can find it. Okay, I'm going to close this, sorry, in the last two minutes. So these are, this is an example, and I'm gonna send the copy of this to you so you can see. This is an example of an evaluation that I use for the colors personality. So this is the real colors. Um, so again, why did you take part in the session? What did you hope to learn? Um, describe the part of the session you most appreciated. Um, how could this session have better met your needs or expectations, or how can this session be improved? How satisfied were you? And then I always ask for the color spectrum. And then this is where it kind of moves into a little bit of the level two where my knowledge improved. Yes, then explain how your knowledge improved. Did my skills improve? Explain. And then did my awareness improve? Explain. Um, and these, those are questions I used on every evaluation that I did. And then you can ignore the bottom questions because those were required by the university. Um, but this was the long version of what I did. And then I would do a short, that was if I had time. This was a short evaluation. Again, I'm just asking those basic questions. Um, but you can see I've got the knowledge, the skills, and the, you know, those level one and level two um, questions. Probably more of a level one than a level two, but still um, an, a one that we can use. All right, in the last couple of minutes, do I, are there any questions about the, the evaluation piece? Um, I know that that was really kind of quick, and, but if you are working on, you know, if you want to evaluate a program that you're doing, like maybe a day camp, and you want to find out how it went, feel, and you, you have questions, feel free to just call me, um, you know, or email me, you can send me a sample of what you're doing. You know, those are the types of things that I'm here for. You can also go to your extension educator. Um, most of them know how to do this. I, hopefully all of them know how to do this and they can help you with it too. But you know, I can, I'm more than willing to help you do, uh, to pull, to put it together. Because like I said, you know, these are the types of things that I wanna, that I wanna try to get more of. Okay, questions, thoughts, comments? I've got 231. So I think we finished with a half a second too late. And I will try, it probably, this probably will not go out until tomorrow, but I will get all of the recording as well as the, the handouts and everything out tomorrow for everybody.